Hi everyone and welcome to QuantPy. In this video we will explore the origins and development of the Basel IRB asset correlation formula for the corporate asset class. For sake of good housekeeping, IRB is internal ratings-based approach. Let's first recap where the IRB formula fits into the IRB capital requirements. We reproduce the IRB formula. This formula is used to calculate the capital requirements for credit risk. In our toolbox, we have the unexpected loss. This is the amount by which the loss at the 99.9% .9 confidence level exceeds the expected loss. Said in a more intuitive way, if all the assumptions hold, then we should be 99.9% .9 confident that the actual loss will not exceed the expected loss amount by an amount greater than this unexpected loss amount. We derived the quantile formula in a previous video, so despite the big words being thrown about here, our QuantPy viewers are already acquainted with the formula. This unexpected loss formula is based on a standard maturity. Portfolios to which this formula is applied to in practice will have maturities longer or shorter than the standard maturity. So the UL amount is adjusted by the maturity adjustment factor. The maturity adjustment is a meaty topic which we promise to unpack in the next video. But for the purposes of this video, maturity adjustment also depends on the probability of default, which is given by a non-linear formula. The effect of the non-linear is that smaller probabilities of default attract higher adjustment. What else do we have in that toolbox? We have the R parameter. The R parameter varies with each portfolio, but for the corporate asset class it is given by this formula. The roadmap for the rest of this video is the context which gave rise to the asset correlation formula with a focus on the underlying maths, i.e. the mechanical part, and our favourite part, the intuition. When Basel started developing the IRB approach, the banks and central banks, or supervisors, had already implemented portfolio loss models. These would be the equivalent of what is called economic capital these days. So the natural starting point was to conduct a survey of the then state of the art. And then, Interpret the survey in terms of the available theory using the expertise of the committee and supporting staff. To cut a long story short, the conclusion was that high-risk borrowers, these would be the corporates with the higher probabilities of default, are more exposed to idiosyncratic risk and less to systemic risk, whereas low-risk borrowers carry more systemic risk. Through the survey and judgment, it was concluded that the low probability of default customer will have an R of 24%, whereas high probability of default customers will have an R of 12%. The numbers would have been loosely based on the survey results and then judgmentally overridden. From what we believe happened is that the minimum of these, the 12%, would have been established based on some average, and then doubled to get the maximum of 24%. Now, if we consider R as a function of the probability of default, then the function will have the value of 0 0.24 at probability of default equals to 0, and 0 0.12 at probability of default equals to 1. Remember, the probability of default domain is between 0 and 1. Now, we can plot R as a function of probability of default. So, the x-axis represents the probability of default, and the y-axis represents R. We can plot the two points. Now, we can fit some sort of line through these two points. For example, we can assume a linear relationship. Remember, the intercept plus slope times the value. So we get a straight line linking the two points. The intercept is at 0 0.24 and the slope is negative 0 0.12. Remember, the slope is the vertical distance divided by the horizontal distance. 
And we see in the chart that when the probability of default increases by 1 from 0 to 1, the R goes down by 0 0.12 from 0 0.24 to 0 0.12. Most of us were never really sold on the idea of negative slopes. So let's reinterpret the equation by changing the x-axis to the probability of non-default. Now the intercept is 0.12 and the slope is positive 0.12. But again, we are assuming that the R varies linearly with the probability of default. The theory and survey results suggest that the relationship between the probability of default and R is not linear. For example, one can assume an exponential relationship. To accommodate this assumption, we can replace 1 minus the probability of default by the exponential of negative probability of default. And now we see R declines exponentially with the probability of default. To see how this differs from the linear relationship, just recall the expansion of e to the power of x. Now, we keep only the first two terms. We get 1 minus p, as in the linear equation. So the exponential can be viewed as a generalization. We can generalize this further by including another parameter in the exponent, which we called k. So now you have more control over the rate of exponential decline. You can make it steeper or less steep, as you wish, by changing k. This k would be selected so that the curve gives a good representation of the data. But first, let's examine the alpha and m. This is very similar to determining the slope and intercept of a linear equation given two pairs of x and y. Remember, we know the values of r at p equals to 0 and at p equals to 1. Substituting 0 for p, we get exponential of 0 is equal to 1, so we get this must equal to 0 0.24. Substituting 1 for p, we get and this must equal to 0 0.12. Now, we need to solve these two equations for alpha and m. We know from the first equation that alpha equals 0 0.24 minus m, so substituting for alpha we get. Now, let's factor m, so we get. Now, let's solve the second equation on the right hand side for m. Let's substitute for alpha from the first equation. Next, we factor out m and shift the 0 0.24 to the right hand side. And now we can isolate m on the left hand side to get. And then substituting this m into the r expression we get. We just need to format it now. Add and subtract the last terms. Combine the middle terms. And when we factor out 0 0.24, then we obtain the formula in the familiar form. Now let's plot this formula again. As we increase k, the curve becomes steeper. And the committee decided that k equals to 50 gives good fit to the survey data they had based their judgment on. And this 50 became the rule of thumb. As you would know, for some institutions, that are more systemically important, this r is multiplied by 1.25, meaning the curve shifts upward proportionally. For small corporates with annual turnover of less than 50 million, the r is shifted downward. Parallel shift is applied, but the size of the parallel shift is proportional to the turnover with the maximum reduction of 4%. So, if the annual turnover is less than 5 million, then the R curve is shifted downward by 4%. Let's see the formula with this size adjustment. The min-max you see here are just to make sure that the adjustment only get applied when the turnover is less than 50 million. And the turnover beyond 5 million does not get any additional adjustment. These rules do change over time. So please, do consult the latest version of the regulations. We hope you enjoyed the video and look forward to seeing you in the next.